Okay, uh, the last speaker today is uh, Jacob Dury. He will speak about abstract algebra in computer theory. All right, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be speaking at this event honoring uh, Emmy Noter. So I think Noter, more than any other mathematician, is associated with the emergence of abstract algebra in the early 20th century. So here's a, an excerpt from uh, the obituary written by her student, Van der Werden. Um, and he wrote uh, that she was compelled to invent conceptual forms which were suitable as carriers for mathematical theories. And I think this has been a, a really just tremendously influential way to think about uh, certain parts of mathematics, that there are certain kinds of mathematical structures like rings and ideals and modules. And once you've given a name to these mathematical structures, you see them everywhere. And they're, they're something that we as mathematicians all need to know about. And so what I would like to do in this talk is, is talk about the appearance of some of these structures um, in my field, which is stable homotopy theory. So let me uh, begin just getting us all on the same page, saying a little bit about what stable homotopy theory is about. So it's part of algebraic topology. And in algebraic topology, what we want to do is understand topological spaces by associating to them algebraic invariants. And maybe one of the, the best known and most important algebraic invariants is the cohomology of a space X uh, with coefficients in some abelian group that I'll denote by A. And uh, well, let me temporarily suppress the A and just let, write this as Hn of x. So there are many different ways of defining these cohomology groups, which turn out to agree when x is a sufficiently nice space. And motivated by this, Eilenberg and Steenrod in the 1940s wrote down a system of axioms for cohomology. They characterize these invariants by, by a list of properties. Um, well, actually what they wrote down is a characterization of homology. So I'm uh, paraphrasing by talking about cohomology instead. So how does cohomology behave? First of all, it's a contravariant functor. So any continuous map induces a map on cohomology groups in the other direction. Um, it's a uh, homotopy invariant, homotopic maps induce the same map on cohomology. Um, cohomology takes disjoint unions of spaces to products of abelian groups. Uh, there are suspension isomorphisms. The reduced cohomology of a space X is the same as the reduced cohomology of its suspension up to a, a shift by one. Um, there's an excision axiom that uh, tells you if, if you have a subspace Y of a space X and you have a cohomology class on X, which vanishes on Y, then it comes from the reduced cohomology of X mod Y. So there's a, an exact sequence like this. And finally, the, there's the so-called dimension axiom, which is a normalization condition. The dimension axiom says that if you look at the cohomology groups of a point, they're very simple. In any non-zero degree, you get zero. And in degree zero, you get the abelian group A that you were taking uh, as your coefficient group. Uh, so Eilenberg and Steenrod essentially proved that uh, this system of axioms that I wrote down characterizes cohomology on nice spaces, or rather homology on nice spaces. Um, any system of invariance which satisfies these axioms must be cohomology with coefficients in some abelian group. And if you want to read off that, what that abelian group is, you take the degree zero cohomology of a point. And so motivated by this and by the fact that there were some other invariants which uh, behaved in similar ways, let's make a definition. A cohomology theory is a system of invariants which satisfies the first five of those axioms, omitting the dimension axiom that says that the cohomology of a point has to be in degree zero. Uh, so I'm going to call this a cohomology theory. And it's not just these invariants, but uh, also these suspension isomorphisms are part of the data. Yeah. 
A, A5, um, well, I stated it without relative cohomology, but uh, uh, there's, there's an exact sequence that if you have a cohomology class on X and it vanishes on a subspace Y, it has to come from a reduced cohomology class on X with Y collapsed to a point. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so a system of invariants um, satisfying these axioms we'll call a cohomology theory or a generalized cohomology theory. And well, an example of course is the one we've already been talking about every abelian group A determines a cohomology theory that I'm going to denote by HA. Uh, and maybe the prototypical example of a cohomology theory that isn't ordinary cohomology is what's called complex K theory. So let's say that X is, is a nice uh, space, like a finite simplicial complex or a compact manifold or something like this. Then um, you can look at complex vector bundles on X and isomorphism classes of complex vector bundles form a commutative monoid where the operation is given by direct sum. And anytime you have a commutative monoid, you can form its growth and deep group. You can just formally adjoin additive inverses. And in that case, you get a group which is often denoted by KU0 of X called the complex K theory of X. Um, so for example, KU0 of a point that's the group of integers because a complex vector bundle on a point is just a complex vector space. Complex vector spaces are classified up to isomorphism by their dimension, which is any natural number. And when you formally adjoin inverses, you get the, the group of integers. Um, so you can extend this definition KU zero of X to an, to one of these cohomology theories. You can define more generally KUN of X for every integer N and all spaces X in such a way that it satisfies that list of axioms that I gave you earlier, except of course for the dimension axiom, A6, what are the uh, complex K groups of a point? Well, what those turn out to be is a copy of the integers in every even degree and zero in every odd degree. So the fact that uh, these groups are periodic with period two, that's the, the content of the, the bot periodicity theorem. So the, there are lots of interesting cohomology theories. So let me just mention um, this construction, taking an abelian group A and looking at cohomology with coefficients in A, that determines a, a functor from the category of abelian groups to the world of cohomology theories, and it's fully faithful. You, for example, you can go back the other way by looking at the zeroth cohomology of a point. And so you can think of cohomology, the world of cohomology theories as some kind of enlargement of the category of abelian groups. And cohomology theories are some kind of generalized abelian group, and that's what's gonna inform this lecture. So the rest of this lecture is going to be about stable homotopy theory. And what, what that's gonna mean for our purposes is that we're going to be interested not so much in topological spaces, but in these cohomology theories. We're gonna shift our focus from cohomology theories being invariants that we use to investigate spaces and we would like to investigate the cohomology theories themselves. And so let me uh, give you a list of analogies. So we're transitioning to the world of what, what I'm gonna call homotopy coherent algebra. Um, it's an enlargement of the world of classical algebra. So uh, we're gonna enlarge the world of sets by considering topological spaces. Every set could be regarded as a special kind of topological space, which has the discrete topology. And we're gonna enlarge the world of abelian groups by considering generalized cohomology theories. Every abelian group determines a cohomology theory, but there are also other examples like complex K theory. And uh, if you're not familiar with the, the word spectrum, it's essentially a synonym for cohomology theory. More precisely, it's a certain kind of mathematical object that represents a cohomology theory. But for the purposes of this talk, I'm not gonna really make a distinction. And we're gonna kind of take seriously the idea that uh, 
this world of cohomology theories is, is like the world of abelian groups. So in the world of abelian groups, there's an operation called the tensor product, and that has a counterpart in the world of cohomology theories, which is called the smash product. It's typically written with this wedge symbol. And well, once you can start talking about uh, tensor products of abelian groups, you can talk about rings. So uh, the notion of an associative ring, which has an analog in the world of cohomology theories called an associative ring spectrum. And commutative ring has an analog in the world of cohomology theories called a commutative ring spectrum. So ring spectra are what I would like to talk about here. So an associative ring spectrum or A infinity ring spectrum, it's a spectrum E, in other words, a cohomology theory, which is equipped with a multiplication E smash E going to E that satisfies some kind of associative law. And well, would require some words to make this precise and say exactly what kind of associativity I mean. But um, let me just tell you how you can think about these. So E is a, is a cohomology theory. So it assigns to every topological space a graded abelian group. And if it has a, the structure of a ring spectrum, then you don't just get a graded abelian group. You actually get a graded ring. There's some way of multiplying cohomology classes together. And that's not quite a, a complete definition when you, talk about a, an associative or a infinity ring spectrum, uh, you have an associative law, not just at the level of cohomology classes, but in some sense at the level of whatever represents your cohomology classes. So I'll say a, a word about that in a minute. Um, and well, there's a similar notion of a commutative or an E infinity ring spectrum. So what are some examples? Well, if, if you take any associative ring R and look at the cohomology with coefficients in R, that's an associative ring spectrum. And if R is a commutative ring, then that's a commutative ring spectrum. And I've only given you one other example of a cohomology theory so far, this complex K theory, KU, that's also an example of a commutative ring spectrum. And uh, remember, complex K theory has to do with vector bundles. And the addition on complex K theory has to do with the fact that you can take direct sums of complex vector bundles. And the fact that this is a ring spectrum is because there's a multiplication on complex K theory that has to do with tensor products of complex vector bundles. And let me, that makes KU of any space into a graded ring, uh, but it's, it's a little bit better than that, right? It's, if you take two vector bundles, uh, E and E prime, it's not just E tensor E prime is isomorphic to E prime tensor E. That's some kind of commutative law uh, that tells you that the multiplication on KU zero is commutative, but it's not like there's some random isomorphism. There's actually a natural isomorphism that has lots of, of nice properties. And saying that KU is a commutative ring spectrum is sort of also uh, encoding this nice structure that you have on all of those isomorphisms. So I would like to now talk about um, the simplest kind of uh, associative ring spectrum. So let's go back to the world of ordinary algebra and talk about the simplest kinds of rings. Arguably the simplest kind of rings are fields. So let's say K is an associative ring the following conditions are equivalent. You could demand that every non-zero element is invertible, or you could demand that every module over K is a free module. And if these conditions are satisfied, we say that K is a field. Here, I'm not gonna require that K is commutative. So in this lecture, um, field really means skew field or, or division algebra. Um, and now let's just copy that definition in the world of of stable homotopy theory. So let E be now an associative ring spectrum rather than an associative ring. The following conditions turn out to be equivalent. Well, you can look at E star of a point, that's a graded ring. And you could demand that every non-zero homogeneous element is invertible. 
So the inverse of an element in degree n will be an element in degree minus n. And just an exercise in, in algebra is that's the same thing as saying that every module, every graded module over this graded ring is a free module. Um, and that's also uh, equivalent to saying something in this world of homotopy coherent algebra, which is that every E module spectrum, every spectrum that has an action of this ring spectrum E is a free module. So these uh, are special examples of associative ring spectra. I'm gonna call these cohomological fields. They're the analogs of fields in this world of stable homotopy theory. So what are some examples? Well, the easiest example is take an ordinary field and then look at the associated cohomology theory and that's one of these cohomological fields. But here's a more interesting example. So let P be a prime number and take complex K theory and reduce it modulo P. In other words, take the cofiber of multiplication by P as a map from KU to itself. Um, so what happens when you compute the KU mod P cohomology of a point? Well, it just looks like you took the KU cohomology of a point. Remember that was Z in every even degree and you reduce it modulo P. So you get something that as a graded ring looks like Z mod P in degree zero, and then you have some invertible element in degree two. So this is a graded ring in which every non-zero homogeneous element is invertible, and therefore KU mod P is an example of a cohomological field. So now you, I wanna ask a question, which is, is this actually, a, whoa, is this an interesting, uh, cohomological field. Is this actually something new or is this essentially mod P cohomology in dressed up in some fancy way? It is, it requires an argument. Yeah. For example, it has uncountably many uh, associative ring structures. So, um, yeah, so there, there's some subtlety there. Okay, so uh, I wanna ask the question, is this KU mod P? Is it, uh, is it something interesting? Is it something new? And to make this question more precise, let, let's review uh, the notion of the characteristic of a field in ordinary algebra. So let's say K and K prime are two fields. Well, here, here's a funny definition. I'll, we'll say that K and K prime have the same characteristic if the tensor product of K and K prime is not equal to zero. So what's that? Tensor product over Z. Tensor product has abelian groups. So you could take this as a definition if you didn't know what it meant by the characteristic of a field, or if you do know, then I'll leave it to you to check this. So motivated by this, let's just make it the analogous definition in the world of cohomology theories. If we have two fields E and E prime, we'll say they have the same characteristic if the smash product of E and E prime is not equal to zero. Um, so remember being a cohomological field, it's the same as saying that every module over E is a free module. So if E and E prime have the same characteristic, this smash product, it's an E module. So it looks like a sum of copies of E. It's also an E prime module. So it looks like a sum of copies of E prime. And therefore you, you learn that a sum of copies of E and a sum of copies of E prime are the same cohomology theory. So using that uh, description, it's not hard to, to see that this is actually an equivalence relation. And we could ask what the equivalence classes look like. So for example, that cohomological field KU mod P that I mentioned earlier, is it really of the same characteristic as one of these classical fields? And the answer is no. And I wanna explain how you can see that they're not, how you can see that the answer is no. 
So the, we're talking about cohomology theories, and what you do with cohomology theories is you evaluate them on a space and see what you get. So let's consider a particularly simple space to evaluate on. So fix a prime number P and let X be the classifying space of the cyclic group Z mod P. So this is a space whose fundamental group is Z mod P and it has no other homotopy groups. And now let's uh, compute the cohomology of this space with coefficients in various, with various kinds of coefficients. So if K is an ordinary field, which has characteristic different from P, then the cohomology of X with coefficients in K is actually zero in all positive degrees. So with coefficients in different from characteristic P, you can't tell the difference between X and a point. X has the same cohomology as a point. And now if you take coefficients in characteristic P, things look very different. The cohomology of X actually is one dimensional in every degree greater than or equal to zero. So as a module over K, the H star is actually infinite rank. Now, what happens if you take this funny example that I mentioned earlier, KU mod P? Well, KU has something to do with, with vector bundles. And there's, there's a way to make vector bundles on this space BG, which is just take any representation of G, complex representation, that, that you can think of as a local system on X, uh, with a local system of complex vector spaces. And in particular, it gives you a, a complex vector bundle. Um, that gives you a construction which turns any representation of G into a complex vector bundle. And it turns out that uh, this KU mod P in degree zero, you get everything this way. Uh, the degree zero cohomology of this space X is just the representation ring of G reduced modulo P. So G is this cyclic group. It has exactly P irreducible representations. And so this is a, a free FP vector space on a basis of size P. And well, complex K theory is periodic with period two. So you get the same answer in every even degree and you get turns out zero in every odd degree. And I just wanna point out these answers all look very different from each other. If you ask what is the rank of the answer as a module over the cohomology of a point, in the first case, we got a module of rank one. In the second case, we got a module of infinite rank. And in the third case, you get a module of rank P. And as a consequence, um, this KU mod P, it's not of the same characteristic as any ordinary field. It's something that's genuinely new. Okay, so uh, what else might you expect to get here? So le let me tell you, there's a complete classification of these uh, cohomological fields up to this equivalence relation of having the same characteristic. So let me tell you how the classification works. Um, I'm gonna tell you in the form of a flow chart. So I give you a cohomology theory, which is a field, and the flow chart will tell you where it fits in the classification. So let E be a field, and then look at the E zero cohomology of a point. Um, then that's a field in the usual sense. It's an ordinary field, and you can ask, First, does that field have characteristic zero? And if the answer is yes, then you're done. E has the same characteristic as the, the usual field Q, or really the, the cohomology theory HQ, cohomology with coefficients in Q. And if it doesn't have characteristic zero, then it has characteristic P for some prime number P. And then I'm gonna let X be the same space as on the previous slide. Uh, space with fundamental group Z mod P. And then compute the E cohomology of X. And that's necessarily, because E is a field, going to be a free module over the E cohomology of a point. And the next question is, does that free module have infinite rank? And if the answer is yes, then you're also done. Then E is actually equivalent to cohomology with coefficients in P, mod P. It's again, a 
a classical field. But it's also possible, as with KU mod P, for the answer to be of finite rank. And one can show in this case that the rank has to be a power of P for some P, uh, has to be of the form P to the N for some N positive integer. And in that case, I'll say that E has height N. And now the theorem is that this integer N is a complete invariant. So for every prime number P and every integer N, there's a cohomological field of height N um, and well, such that E zero of a point is a field of characteristic P. Moreover, all such fields have the same characteristic in the sense of the previous uh, definition. Yeah. Well, all fields of characteristic zero have the same characteristic. I'm, I'm cl classifying these things up to characteristic. So yeah, thank you. All right, so if we're interested, so this theorem is saying, if we're interested in exotic examples, examples that don't come from ordinary algebra, then there's exactly two invariants if we want to classify things up to having the same characteristic. First, there's a prime number P, which is the characteristic of the cohomology of, a point, of E naught of a point. And then there's this height N, which tells you how interesting it is when you compute the cohomology of a classifying space of a cyclic group. Um, so this cohomological field is typically called, it's called the nth Morava K theory. It's typically denoted by K of N. Um, so there's a, also a prime P involved in the definition, but uh, the prime that's usually suppressed from the notation. And an example, well, we met earlier this cohomological field KU mod P. And when we computed the KU mod P cohomology of BCP, we got exactly a module of rank P over the cohomology of a point. So that was a cohomology theory of cohomological field of height one, and that's what we're calling K of one here. So the reason these things are called Morava K theories, well, they're named after Morava, who, I don't know if he proved this whole theorem, but he proved the existence at least. Um, and uh, they're named after Morava and they behave like K theory. They're, they're higher K theories or generalized K theories. They specialize to K theory or K theory reduced mod P uh, when you take N to be one. So let me make a few remarks about this. So first, it's uh, sometimes nice to extend the convention, the definition of K of N to allow N also to be zero or infinity. By convention, K of zero means cohomology with coefficients in Q or in some field of characteristic zero. And K infinity means cohomology with coefficients uh, in FP or some field of characteristic P. And you could, if you fix a prime number P, you can then think you have this sequence of cohomology theories. It starts with cohomology uh, with coefficients in Q. It ends with cohomology coefficients mod P, but there are all these intermediate examples of given by Morava K theories that are somehow of characteristic uh, in between zero and P. And so these Morava K theories are associative ring spectra. And it turns out they cannot be made commutative. So earlier I said, I wanted field to mean skew field. And the reason is this, uh, if you are interested in, if you make the definition of cohomological field, but you wanna work with commutative ring spectra, you won't see any exotic examples. And finally, uh, this K of N, well, I just told you it was uh, some field where some cohomological field of height N, it's really only well-defined up to its characteristic. So in the literature, people often uh, use the convention that K of N is made as small as possible. Uh, it's, it's the analog of a prime field like Q or FP. Um, 
But even if you make the convention that k of n is as small as possible, it actually still doesn't have a unique ring structure. So you really shouldn't think of these things as, as quite unique. You should think really, uh, well, it's a representative of some equivalence class. OK, so the rest of this lecture, I would like to talk about another of Notaire's interests, um, which, which was the representation theory of finite groups. And I would like to talk about representation theory in this exotic context. I would like to do representation theory not for vector spaces over an ordinary field, but for modules over one of these cohomological fields. So let me start by reminding you of a few um, things about the classical representation theory of finite groups. So let G be a finite group. And let's start by talking about representation theory in characteristic zero. And in this case, one of the first things that you prove is that representations are completely reducible. Any representation of G on a K vector space splits as a sum of irreducible representations. And if you want to prove this, the essential case is to show that you can split off uh, any trivial, any copy of the trivial representation that you can find inside of V, you can split off as a direct sum act. So another way of saying that is if you take the uh, subspace of invariant vectors, the elements of V that are fixed by the action of the group. So that's a subspace of V and it's a direct sum end as a representation of G. So let's just go through the proof of this. So how do you prove complete reducibility? So let's consider in addition to the invariant subspace of V, let's consider the co-invariance, the quotient of V by the action of G. I'll denote that by V lower G. And so the invariant subspace is something that sits inside V and the co-invariance is a quotient of V. And in particular, there's an obvious map from the invariant of G to the co-invariance of V. And well, the, in order to prove that the invariants are a direct sum end of V, it's sufficient to show that this composite map is actually an isomorphism from the invariants to the co-invariants. And to prove that this map is an isomorphism, you can write down a map in the opposite direction. Namely, there's a construction which averages with respect to the action of the group G. Given a vector, you can take the sum of G of V over all elements of the, your finite group. That gives you a map from vector space to itself. But by construction, it lands in the invariant part of, uh, of V. And it factors through, it annihilates everything of the form G V minus V. So it factors through the co-invariance. So this defines a map in the opposite direction called the norm map. It goes from co-invariance to invariance. And what, in order to prove that this obvious map is an isomorphism, you show that essentially these two maps are inverses of each other. That's not quite right. What's true is that if you compose these two maps in either direction, you get multiplication by the order of the finite group G. And I said that we were working over a field of characteristic zero. So multiplying by the order of G is an isomorphism. And note a corollary of this proof is also that for, if we're in characteristic zero, this norm map that I just described is always an isomorphism. Isomorphism from co-invariance to invariance. Now that's how things work in characteristic zero. So what happens in positive characteristic? So suppose that we're studying representations over a field of characteristic P. Well, if P does not divide the order of the group G, then you can say all of the same things that I just said. You can still divide by the order of the group G, so representations of G are completely reducible. But there's an opposite extreme. You could consider the case where G is a P group. And in that case, complete reducibility fails very dramatically, but you, you get another phenomenon to compensate for that. If G is a P group, actually every irreducible representation of G is, is trivial. Um, and the essential point here 
is to show that if V is a non-zero representation of a finite P group, then it has non-zero, it has a non-zero invariant vector. Oh. So let me just contrast these two stories. So for representations, let's specialize to the case of a P group. Um, in characteristic zero, we have this complete reducibility phenomenon. In characteristic P, representations are unipotent. Um, so what is that saying? In characteristic zero, ex all extensions between representations are trivial. In characteristic P, all the irreducible representations are trivial. So what's interesting in characteristic zero is the classification of the irreducibles. And what's interesting in characteristic P are the extensions, extensions of the trivial representation by itself. So these phenomena of complete reducibility and unipotence, they're, they're in tension with each other. You can't have both of these properties. If, if all the irreducibles were trivial and everything split as a sum of irreducibles, then all representations would be trivial. So the question I wanna ask is, uh, Okay, here's a classical story contrasting characteristic zero with characteristic P, but in homotopy theory, we have all of these intermediate characteristics given by these Morava K theories. And what happens when we study representation theory over those kind of fields? Do they behave like they're of characteristic zero or do they behave like they're of characteristic P? And the answer is a little of each. So now let Kn be a Morava K theory. And I, I mean something genuinely not coming from algebra. So N is a positive integer. And now let's say V is a Kn module that has an action of a finite group G. So then you have replacements for the notion of the invariant subspace and the co-invariants, which are called the, the homotopy fixed points and the homotopy co-invariants. So that's typically denoted by uh, V HG and V lower HG. And just as in classical algebra, there's a natural comparison map, some kind of averaging over the action of G, which gives you a map from covariance to invariance. And a, a theorem of Hovey and Sadovsky is that this map is always an isomorphism. So that earlier, I noted that in characteristic zero, it's something that fell out of the proof of complete reducibility. And the essence of the proof in characteristic zero was you're allowed to divide by the order of the group G. Now this theorem is non-trivial. This is not true because you're allowed to divide by the order of the group G. You're definitely not allowed to do that. This norm map is still an isomorphism. Now this does not imply complete reducibility, the, there's also the, an obvious map, the invariance of, for the action of G that maps into V and V maps to the co-invariance. This composite map is not usually an isomorphism. Um, so the invariants don't split off, but nonetheless, you have this norm isomorphism. So that's saying it looks a little bit like characteristic zero, not entirely, but at least it has a, a common feature. And well, let me mention, it also look, behaves a little bit like characteristic P. So if G is a P group, um, then you have a, a unipotence phenomenon here too. If you take any non-zero representation, then the, if you look at the invariant part, that's also non-zero. So that's telling you that in some sense, everything is generated by the trivial representation. Um, so, I wanna just say a few words about this uh, first theorem. So what, it, what is it telling you? It's telling you something interesting, even when V is the trivial representation. When V is the trivial representation, what this is saying, the left-hand side, um, I mean, these are both cohomology theories and then you can compute the cohomology of a point. And then you're saying that two abelian groups are isomorphic to each other. And on the left-hand side, what that's computing is the KN homology of the classifying space BG. And on the right-hand side, it's computing the KN cohomology of the classifying space BG. And 
this is telling this theorem of Hovey and Sadovsky is, is telling you that there's a canonical isomorphism between those. So that's some kind of duality phenomenon. It's saying that BG kind of behaves like a manifold. It, it has some kind of Poincaré duality. Um, and more generally, these cohomology theories KN, a, a consequence of this theorem of the previous slide, is not just for BG, but for anything that's like a compact orbifold, you have some version of Poincaré duality with coefficients in KN. So that's, again, something that's saying that these cohomology theories KN feel like they're characteristic zero. If you look at the ordinary cohomology of orbifolds, well, they satisfy Poincaré duality with characteristic zero coefficients, but not with characteristic P coefficients if P divides the order of some stabilizer group. That's a minus sign, yeah. No, no, they're all defined over all integers. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so let me just uh, say a few words about this duality phenomenon in a context where it will be a little bit familiar to you. So let's consider the only um, Morava K theory that that we're equipped to understand right now, which is the first Morava K theory. Remember, that's complex K theory mod P. So let G be a finite P group, and let me write rep G for its representation ring. So that's the usual complex representation ring. It's a free abelian group with one generator for every irreducible complex representation. And well, this representation ring, a classical fact of representation theory, these representation rings are always self-dual. There's a bilinear form on this representation ring, which takes two representations V and W and assigns the dimension of the space of homomorphisms from V to W. And there's a usual formula for this in terms of the characters of the representation um, that involves dividing by the order of the group. And well, something that I mentioned earlier when the group was uh, Z mod P, it's actually true more generally for any P group that if you take the mod P K theory of BG, when G is a finite P group, you just get the representation ring of G reduced modulo P. And this bilinear form is giving you, if you reduce this mod P, it's giving you an identification of the K1 cohomology of BG with its dual. And that identification is the same as the one that comes out of this theorem of Hubby and Sadovsky. So that um, in the case n is equal to one, the phenomenon that you're seeing, it's related to the fact that you have this, uh, this Hom pairing on representation rings. Now, if you, the reason that this is, um, I mentioned earlier, it's, it's sort of maybe uh, unexpected that that norm map is an isomorphism for Morava K theories, that the content of that theorem is, is maybe a little bit surprising because you're not allowed to divide by the order of the group. You can kind of see here, if you tried to write down this pairing without knowing that, uh, if you tried to write things out in terms of characters without knowing uh, that uh, K theory had to do with representations, you know, this looks like it might be some complex number, which is not an integer because it's some, uh, some sum with divided by the order of the group G. It's not a priori well-defined, but because it has this interpretation as the dimension of a space of Homs, you know that it has to be an integer. And so for other Morava K theories, what's going on is some kind of similar phenomenon that um, there, there are some curious divisibility properties uh, Although the, the explanation for those is a little bit more mysterious because we don't know uh, what the co-cycles for these cohomology theories mean. Okay, so uh, let me just close by mentioning a, a recent application of these ideas in a fairly unexpected place. So um, let's say M is a closed symplectic manifold, which is equipped with a non-degenerate Hamiltonian flow. Um, so about two years ago, I think, there's a, a paper of Abu Zaid and Blumberg, which proved 
a version of the Arnold conjecture, which tells you that the number of periodic orbits of this Hamiltonian flow is bounded below by the rank of the uh, homology of the manifold with mod p coefficients. So this was known earlier with a, a worse bound. If you replace fp by q, then this is a this this is a statement that was known earlier and was, uh, I think, one of the first application of this theory of, of floor homology. And the way that they proved this theorem, or the way that they, they extended these ideas and got a better bound, is they developed a theory of floor homology, not with coefficients mod p, but they with coefficients in these Morava k theories that I've been telling you about. And the reason that they, they ultimately wanted to get a bound that involved the, the mod p Betty numbers, but they can't use mod p cohomology directly in the proof because uh, mod p cohomology doesn't have the feature that I mentioned earlier that compact orbifolds satisfy Poincaré duality. So it was essential to their construction that, um, that you have good duality properties for whatever cohomology theory you're using. And it, so their, their proof really exploits the fact that these Morava K theories are, are exotic things that behave a little bit like characteristic zero objects and a little bit like characteristic P objects. They behave like characteristic zero objects by virtue of having um, Poincaré duality for compact orbifolds. And they behave like characteristic P objects because they detect information about mod P cohomology. Uh, they detect torsion phenomena. Okay, I think uh, I will stop there. Thank you very much. Does the proof still use floor cohomology as well? What's that? Does the, the proof still also use floor cohomology? Like the class, classical? Yeah. Well, I think it's, it, I haven't read the paper. It, it's quite long. Um, my, my impression of what they do is that they develop a version of the floor complex with coefficients in these exotic cohomology theories. So I think it's strictly harder than the usual construction. Um, Which app do they use? So they use, so the, these Murata K theories, uh, the cohomology of point is periodic. And if you try to make the period as long as possible, so I mentioned earlier, sometimes people by Morava K theory, they mean the prime fields that are as small as possible, then the period is um, two times P to the N minus one. And so the idea is, uh, you know, you want to define some kind of floor complex and then show that the floor complex is actually the same as the ordinary homology of M. And now if this N is much, it's very large compared to the dimension, or, well, large compared to log p of the dimension, actually, then the atier Hirzebruck spectral sequence will degenerate. And you'll just learn that the Morava k theory of M looks like a, a periodic version of the mod p cohomology of M. So the, the answer is they use kn for n large enough that it looks like the ordinary cohomology of M. I give an example where this produces periodic orbits, which you didn't know before. What's that? Do they give an example where this would produce, it's, you're uh, giving a band from below, but where it's, where it's even producing periodic orbits, which you didn't know exist before. So you mean like an example of a specific symplectic manifold? Yeah. I am not sure. And that's for any P, right? Sorry? That's the lower bounds for any P. The lower bound is for any P, yeah. More questions? Um, we, um, so the Morava K theories are a kind of cohomology. We, we are talking about this as a kind of cohomology theory. Mm -hmm. What was the homology one between the duality statement? Well, um, because Morava K theory is like uh, homology with coefficients in the field, in particular, the sort of, it has a very simple universal coefficient theorem, like the, 
The KN homology is the vector space, well, the KN cohomology is the vector space <coughs> of the KN homology. And if things are finite enough, there's the other works the other way too. So another way of saying this is that the, the KN uh, cohomology of the space is, is self-dual. There is no more question. Let's thank the speaker again.